For a long time, Fire Emblem fans have been teased with the knowledge that a new game was coming for the Nintendo Switch. It was an exciting prospect considering the series hadn't been on a home console since Radiant Dawn in 2007. How would the series take advantage of the extra power now available? Well, thanks to the E3 2018 Nintendo Direct, we now have an answer. Fire Emblem Three Houses seems like it has a lot of potential, but what's actually new about it besides the obvious visual upgrade? It's time to load up the old analysis machine for a closer look at the reveal trailer to see what kind of secrets and hidden details we can find. And we'll begin with a new story that's being told. According to the trailer, long ago the Divine Seros received a revelation from the Goddess, a gift to help the lost. Now the Goddess watches over Fodlin from her kingdom above as the mother of all life, the arbiter of every soul. This isn't necessarily a good thing though, as according to info from Nintendo, the Church of Saros exercises great power over the land of Fodlin and its people, and it comes across that they are the one true ruler of this continent, not the three houses in the title. Unfortunately, we don't know many concrete details beyond that, but there are clues to what might lie ahead. And one of the biggest is a look at the continent of Fodlin itself, where there are four main locations in bold. The text isn't the easiest to read though, so we've tried our best to make them out. And first, there's a Drartan to the south where it features a two-headed hawk on its crest, while a feather-like design is the country's symbol. In the north, there's Fergus where its crest features a knight riding upon a griffin, while its symbol is just above the text. And then there's Leicester in the east that features a shield crest with a knight's helmet and a moon that also serves as its symbol. In the center of the three is Barg Mac a mountain range that seems to act as a natural border, at least between Fergus and the other countries. In addition, there are dozens of other locations marked on the map, likely indicating important towns and battlefields that will be visited over the course of the game. With so many, it's probably going to be a pretty meaty story and may even feature the ability to actively travel the map like in Fire Emblem Awakening. And wait a second, there's no way. <laughs> Okay then, let's just move on as the trailer shifts to an image that seems to show the will of the goddess. Three figures are shown at the bottom, presumably each one represents a different house, but that might not be the case as the one in the center seems to be Saros herself. Above Saros are dragons flying all around which may act as emissaries of the goddess who stands above all with her angel wings. There's not enough context to truly interpret this, but we believe dragons do play a big part in Saros and the church. As this picture is being shown, the trailer intercuts with scenes of a battle, specifically a woman standing stoically as soldiers fight all around her. We believe that she's the latest representative of the church of Saros as she's dressed similarly to the woman in that painting. Not only that, but the crown on her head features dragon wings showing reverence to the dragons that fly below the goddess. There's a definite connection between the two. She's also equipped with a shield in her left hand, but there's no sign of a weapon in her right. Instead, she stands perfectly still even as the battle rages around her. Interestingly, the soldiers on her side are fighting with rapiers while the opposing force is equipped with broadswords. It may be a small yet intentional nod to the idea that the church is composed and refined while the enemy army are brutish and more keen at hacking away. And this is further emphasized by the giant of a man that rushes to attack her until one of her own soldiers steps in to block it. The entire time she stands motionless as if completely sure that her men will protect her. Not even the bits of armor and mud that fly up from the fighting seem to phase her. In fact, the only emotion we ever see from her is later in the trailer when she picks up a sword that's broken and deteriorated yet still cradles it gently. More importantly, this sword features dragon wings on the hilt, likely indicating that this is an important item of the church and the goddess. In fact, it's the same sword that we saw Saros hold in the mural. Perhaps the church is hunting down lost armor and weapons that were blessed by the goddess? That could also be the reason this battle is taking place at all as she goes to war with those that would keep the artifacts for themselves. But this is all just extrapolation and theory on our part. What is evident is that she had to take part in the battle at some point. Her cloak, arm guard, and crown all feature black scuff marks that weren't there previously. 
Did she finally have to fight back against the enemy army? Or is this the result of the mud and dirt getting kicked up around her? We don't know for sure, but someone who acts that at ease in the middle of battle can likely hold their own just fine. It does seem to be a massive battle though, as one of the cinematics shows just how many mounted knights and pegasus knights are a part of this army as they rush the enemy. There's one more cinematic shown during the trailer that features a massive battle, but it doesn't seem to be the same one that featured the Church of Saros. Instead, it focused on an older man with a chainsword that wipes out a huge swath of soldiers in red. We have no idea what side he's on, as even the symbol on the back of his cape doesn't match any of the houses from the map. So is he with the church, against it, or is this a wholly different conflict between two countries? We just can't say for sure. More mysterious than that though is the scene at the very end of the trailer that shows a green-haired girl sleeping on a stone chair. And this girl is almost certainly Tiki, or that's the impression given. Yet despite that, Nintendo described Fodlin as a new world. Maybe they mean it's more of a new continent that hasn't been seen before, which could place it in the same world as Marth in the original Fire Emblem. It wouldn't be the first time this has been done as Fire Emblem Gaiden and by extension its remake, Shadows of Valentia, took place during the same time as Marth on a different continent. Maybe this works like that, which would explain the presence of Tiki in her younger form, rather than the older Tiki seen in Awakening. Then again, it could just be another green-haired girl with pointed ears and similar clothes, as the design isn't exactly like Tiki's. Now, that's just the story, as there's also plenty of gameplay shown that provides a look at what's the same, what's different, and our new protagonists. We begin with the battlefield, which has a graphical style that matches the rest of the game, rather than the sprite-based look that was used on handhelds. It makes sense as this was the same style used for the last console Fire Emblem games, Path of Radiance and Radiant Dawn. But obviously there's even more detail here than before, with the mountains forming a border around the battlefield and even rocks piled up on top of each other to give a better sense that this is a natural setting. Despite the visual upgrades, certain squares on the map still provide bonuses based on the landscapes. As always, the forest spaces will allow any units on them an increase to their dodging ability by 10. And as the cursor continues to move, we meet the first of our new protagonists, Idleguard. With the cursor over her, we can see that blue spaces still mark a unit's movement range, while the red spaces indicate the attack range. Considering the red goes two spaces beyond her movement, Idleguard has a ranged attack to complement her close range steel axe. At first, it seems easy to assume that this is because she's equipped with a hand axe, but as we'll see later, that's not the case. There is something new here though. As the cursor is focused on Idleguard, we see new lines that trace from the enemy units that are within her attack range to the player's units. This pretty clearly indicates that players will now be shown who enemy units are most likely to attack, which has the potential to greatly aid the player. Now it becomes clear which enemies should be focused on first. However, as we said, this only applies to units within Idleguard's attack range as there's no line from the enemy unit just beyond. Your other ally units include an archer, a mage, and a soldier, along with a new player character with his sword. While the designs of the other three units aren't as detailed as the player or idol guard, these may be placeholders for now as many other units seem generic, but actually have portraits. However, it's also possible that these are simply generic stand-ins as part of the training lesson we see idol guard mention later in the trailer. Either way, the enemy units contain an archer, a thief, and what appears to be a mage, but we'll soon see that this isn't the case. Another interesting detail with the battles is that even though the maps are still grid-based, units don't follow those exact squares when moving. Instead, we see Idleguard cut across the squares to reach the destination in the shortest distance. And as the camera comes closer to the units, we can see that their health is clearly and quickly displayed below them thanks to a bar. Finally, we see Idleguard open the command menu where she can choose attack, use magic, use special combat arts, change her soldier's formation, equip a different weapon, use an item, or simply wait. The enemy sightlines have also changed the focus on her, including the unit she couldn't reach previously, meaning that this attack will change on the fly as units move and rearrange themselves on the battlefield. 
It's also worth noting that the magic option explains how Idleguard is able to attack from a distance, though we don't see what spell she has to use. Instead, she chooses attack, which displays even more information about her, including the fact that she's actually from a Drartan based on her sigil. She also has the brand new Aristocrat class, which seems to allow her to use both axes and swords along with magic, making her very potent very early as far as attack options. What's especially interesting to note, though, is the return of weapon durability, which hadn't been seen since Fire Emblem Awakening. Curiously, despite the enemy unit's generic design, the character Idleguard attacks has a portrait and is named Mercedes. It's not a great matchup for Idleguard because of her axe, indicating that the classic weapon triangle returns, but she'll hit harder. Unfortunately, that also means she only has a 67% chance of actually hitting Mercedes, who is faster and more accurate, but weaker. She also has far less HP at only 13. Finally, it appears that players can change the weapons of their characters from this menu as well, streamlining the process of comparing the best weapon for the situation. Once the attack is chosen, the map smoothly transitions into the actual battle, with Idleguard and her troops rushing toward Mercedes, all equipped with axes. As we'll see throughout the trailer, a unit's troops will always have the same weapon as their leader. Luck is on Idleguard's side as she lands the attack on Mercedes while providing a better look at her model. Here we can see the reason Mercedes looked generic. The hair shown in her profile picture is covered by her hat and the cloth draping from it. Again, it's unclear if these are just temporary models that will be replaced by more accurate representations at release, or if Mercedes is just a one-off enemy with a portrait like in past games. That said, there's no dialogue between the two when the fight takes place, so we're leaning more toward the former. We do see Mercedes return one attack, and the animation indicates that the other is coming, but it cuts to another battle before we can see it, which is a bit of a shame since we wanted to compare the quality of the attack animations to Shadows of Valentia. But the transition shows us the next protagonist of the game, Dimitri, who uses a lance. This seems to be a different battle altogether as he's fighting a generic soldier, though this soldier is wearing the same armor we saw fighting alongside Saros but that only applies to the main unit, not the troops. It's not entirely clear what this could mean. What is apparent is that Dimitri completely outclasses this soldier and even seems like he'll get a second hit, though once again the trailer cuts away before we see it. It's then that we see the third main character of the game, Claude, who seems to be fighting on the same foggy battlefield as Dimitri. This could mean that this is a map that features the fog of war, but we only ever see battles, not the strategy. We can see a few ruins nearby, however, and a castle in the distance, which is important for later. Claude actually uses a bow for his weapon, allowing him to attack from afar with no issue. However, as we'll soon see, the bow is a bit different from classic Fire Emblem. We see this during the next scene where a brand new view of the battlefield is shown with an overhead map on the right side of the screen. Even though it's zoomed in, this map is pretty useful considering that it shows the weapon of every nearby unit. We can see archers, mages, lance soldiers, and swordsmen as options. The view also shows each unit's troop formation and a portrait of the unit itself. In fact, we can see the new player character on the left, while Claude is on the right, mainly because we know he uses a bow. It's not long before we see that the canon name for the player character is Byleth, and the presence of a player character at all besides the three main protagonists indicates that romance options will return in three houses, though they are far from the focus in this trailer. Instead, this new view shows that we can see the portraits of the enemy units as well, including this pink-haired girl who's an archer. In fact, as the cursor moves closer, we see that the mage on the left is an old man with a mustache, the second archer is a green-haired boy, and the lance soldier is a purple-haired boy. This many portraits has led us to wonder, are these all main characters? It's strange to have this many enemy units with a portrait, and as we saw with the kingdom soldier, that's not always the case. So perhaps this is a mock battle that serves as training for the player. After all, later in the trailer we see Idleguard talking about training and a mock battle. It's even in a classroom-like setting within a castle, and throughout the trailer Idleguard refers to Byleth as an instructor and teacher. It's another guiding role for the player that has different implications than a strategist like in Awakening or royalty like in Fates. 
it could indicate that the player character has more of a background role in the story, kind of like the strategist in Fire Emblem for the Game Boy Advance. This scene also shows that each character could be trained in a certain way, with the player able to choose whether Idleguard focuses on her sword or axe training. Interestingly, magic isn't an option for her, but there's no clear reason why. We think this training could be how new combat skills are learned for each character, leading to a degree of possible personalization. After all, you're basically shaping your students. Before we return to the battle, we wanted to mention that while Idleguard calls you her teacher, she also talks about Cress and how each house has one with the idea that they bring order to Fodlin. But according to her, they're the complete opposite, lending an early idea that these crests are the namesake Fire Emblem of the game. In fact, this even has hints to the Fire Emblem in Sacred Stones. In many ways, it feels like Three Houses pulls elements from across the series. Returning to the battle with a new point of view, we see that the pink-haired girl is named Hilda. In addition, the map on the right has changed to show the various differences in the map's terrain allowing players to easily locate a better spot to fight from. What's curious is the blue space at the top. This could either be the goal that your characters have to reach, or perhaps another kind of special space, maybe one where units can heal a little each turn. More important though is the battle against Hilda. Remember, she's an archer, yet we can clearly see that she can fight back after Byleth's initial attack. This means that, like in Shadows of Valentia, archers can once again attack units next to them and don't need to stay a space away. What this could mean for their other advantages, we'll have to see. Another battle is then shown with Dimitri changing his troops' battle formation before sending them forward to tear through the troops of the enemy unit. Interestingly, this doesn't seem to have any effect on the unit itself. While we don't know the exact effect, we imagine it could be in the same vein as Advance Wars, where the less troops a unit has, the weaker their attack or defense. So even if a unit can't damage the enemy directly, they might be able to weaken them in other ways. The changes in formation may also work like the Weapon Triangle, where each one is effective against and weak to another. Again, we don't know for sure, but this seems to be what the trailer implies. Otherwise, we see a mage use the fire spell on an enemy, though we don't know who the unit is. Byleth is also shown fighting in a volcano setting, where we get to see the beginning of the new critical hit animation. The last bit of gameplay to cover features Claude fighting some kind of automaton in a dungeon-like setting. It's difficult to say if this is a monster, a different kind of unit, or something used for training. The setting also makes us wonder if the explorable dungeons from Shadows of Valentia return, considering that Byleth can freely walk in other areas. Well, the only location we really see Byleth explore is a Drarden castle, which appears to be the same castle that could be seen in the background during Claude and Dimitri's foggy battle. Inside the castle, we see confirmation that this is part of a Drarden thanks to the symbol on the nearby wall. This means that all of the protagonists come from this country rather than each one representing a different house. Now that still could be the case if two others were sent here for schooling from the other kingdoms, but for now we'll assume they all grew up here. Byleth seems able to explore the castle completely at his leisure, with soldiers milling about, players able to explore the courtyard, and even a scene where we run past Claude hanging out nearby. While the area behind Byleth in this scene seems to be a throne room, the benches lined up paints it as more of a church, showing just how much influence the Church of Saros has. It does lead us to wonder though if something akin to Mila's turnwheel from Shadows of Valentia will return for this game. There's no evidence of this, of course, but it was a feature that many appreciated from that remake. While there's still much that we don't know about Fire Emblem Three Houses, what was shown paints a picture of a game that we can't help but be excited about. Classic features are here, new ideas are in place, the art style is akin to the one in Shadows of Valentia, and it seems like an amalgamation of elements from across the entire series. We can't wait to hear more about it as we begin the long wait for the spring of 2019. Of course, if we missed anything, let us know in the comments. Thanks for watching and be sure to hit that subscribe button for future analyses and even more from Game Explain.